It's funny how there's a constant pressure on time. Now how this happened is because we perceive light as self-awareness or self-awareness as light. That's why our vision is the most is the predominant of our senses. To perceive our reality as the electromagnetic spectrum. What we do not realize is that self consciousness is a construct. It is something that is being constructed. And to construct something, you need tools. You need know how and you need tools. Now, where is the know how and the tools? What is supplying the, 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 the know how? constructing something as something as uh, as elusive to define as self self awareness what is it that goes into the construction what is it that makes this possible but where is the technical know how coming from that is what the it's my principles of organized complexity that is what they seek to prove <coughs> Because if the light is a construct, then it means that where it really comes from is the blackness, the darkness, the blackness, whatever you want to call it. Because it contains the organizing principle. It is the organizing principle. It is in the darkness and the blackness that the entire visible part of the universe is orchestrated it is put together it is built the know-how is coming from there and that's because the source of all that technical know-how is from the sixes as the foundation of organized complexity that's why it's the blackness And so in this realization where you have people constantly pushing towards the light, always want to be in the light. Think about it. People are, what's the lifespan of an average human being? After that, they're gone. And before that, they're not even here. So it is safe to say that self-awareness is like a ripple or an impulse in the darkness and the blackness. For most of the time, it is not here. And even when it is here, how how long do we spend sleeping where that self-consciousness dissolves? So even in the self-awareness and the light, where we have to immerse ourselves in the darkness periodically, otherwise it, you know, otherwise self-awareness becomes impossible to maintain. First you go crazy and then you die. You can't sleep. That's really what it is. So it's not about just focusing on the light, focusing on the, the light. This, if you if you immerse yourself one hundred percent in the light, you go. You just human human existence will end. I mean, the realization that we have today is coming from those who discarded the idea of the blackness. It was necessary for them. They removed the idea of the blackness. They removed it. So everything needs to focus on the light. And this was done for very flimsy reasons, like, you know, trying to push an agenda which, you know, reveals it, an extremely deep level of ignorance. Because by doing so, the sum total of that is that human existence is perceived as or awareness is perceived as strictly the time that you have in the light. Outside of that, there is no existence whatsoever. And so a lot of pressure is generated on the time in the light. And that's what motivates everyday reality. People wake up and build empires and build buildings and build they act like there's gonna be no tomorrow. In order to make this possible, 
human awareness needed to be damned. The experience, the experiential awareness of consciousness, it needed to be damned, to be truncated, so that the whole of blackness is not visible. Because if you can see the whole of blackness and how the light emerges from it, then you realize that we are not actors on a stage reading a script, which is what it would seem like if we just emerged into the light from nothing, played our roles and disappeared. Which is what it looks like especially for someone like me who studies astrology. But what it really is, is that the entirety of the structure, which involves the blackness, which is of the darkness, which is the major composition of, of existence itself, implies that there are no choices. There is nobody that is choosing. There's nobody that's acting a script. In fact, there's nothing but a blip and the blip is just another behavior of the blackness what it does occasionally when it needs to focus on something maybe a question something arose in the blackness a kind of question and if you understood the nature of the blackness you would realize that such things can't exist in the blackness. It is perfect. Its mechanisms, its processes, the only thing they give is perfection. So as soon as a question arises, for whatever reason, a question would exist, then it sets in the, into motion the process of not, the process of resolving that question back into the perfection that it is. That process of resolving that back into perfection, that is the nature of the physical observable universe. It is what is exemplified in mankind. That's why nature builds, kept building ever more sophisticated uh, central nervous systems to the point where you can build a central nervous system that is sophisticated enough to become self-aware. Because it is only when the process is self-aware that the question can now be tackled. And the question is really very simple. Can you perceive the nature of perfection? Do you understand what it is? Who it is? That is the whole point. Because it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, whether you believe what I'm saying or not, I don't care. The fact is human beings spend an inordinate amount of time sleeping. Not just human beings, those creatures fall asleep. The ones who need the sleep the most are the ones who are more self-aware. That's because the machinery that produces self-consciousness needs to take a break. Now, why would it want to do that if self-consciousness was actually a thing, per se? It is a lens, just like a lens, a convex lens can focus the rays of the sun towards an intense spot. If you, be, if you, if you put this on a material for long enough, it will, it will burn. The machinery of the, of the brain focuses consciousness into self-awareness. In that state of self-awareness, which we all experience, it is, imp it is an extremely challenging task to think of a kind of consciousness that is not self-aware. And yet, it's human existence. It's extreme because... I mean, seriously, what would you be if you couldn't pull yourself together as an I? What would you be? And in one of my earlier podcasts, The Astrology of Self-Consciousness, I really explained 
how fortunate we are to be able to pull ourselves that we evolved under the kind of, in this kind of solar system with the sun and the moon which enabled the facilitate or which facilitated the emergence of a unitary type of self-awareness that's really what it is because we are already hitting at the truth unlike those like the type of consciousnesses that would evolve on the dual suns or three suns or whatever it's really what it is so it got me thinking that you spend so much time trying to be an ego trying to actualize trying to focus try to you know when the, when the majority of our awareness does not include this kind of ability you know we could also explain for the reason why human beings are very bad at self-consciousness because this whole idea of choosing, I mean, when you talk about life and the mistakes being made in life and the entire general misery of life in terms of choosing and making mistakes, learning, and yeah, we, you know, we have very important moments all built around love that make the experience on this rock worthwhile. It gives it meaning, meaning that could not be achieved in any other way. Because everything else is just ridiculously futile. Because you know, it doesn't, you know, the very idea that people need to leave this rock and disappear forever. It makes the acquisition of anything stupid. It makes the the gratification of the ego completely stupid. Because what are you gratifying? It's like a breast. It's here today and not it's gone the very next day. What is it to be what is it that it needs to be gratified to be honest? And yet it is necessary for self-awareness, for the illusion of choice which we must engage in every day. I have always found that very dubious because which people actually choose? Do you choose the circumstances you are born into? You don't so what exactly is your choice in a world where the past largely determines the future not just in human relations but in all physics in the physical universe itself i mean you get a lot of um, motivational speakers who talk about disconnecting the past and moving forward if you could really do that you'd be schizophrenic truth is that nobody can the past is the foundation upon which you stand to construct your future and every day with the rules being played on earth the consequences of that past are being ingrained deeper and deeper so they become more restrictive it doesn't matter what anybody thinks it doesn't you know people can say all sorts of things that they want it really doesn't make any difference those whose consciousness or self-awareness has been able to embrace uh, the darker parts they've been able to grapple with their ignorance which is what the darkness really you know symbolizes in the presence of self-awareness because you can't penetrate it that's why everyone's afraid of death because you can't penetrate it you don't know how to extract any information from it but the information cannot be extracted from it. It is a singularity for self-awareness. But just like black, the inside of black holes are singularities for, for electromagnetic radiation, it doesn't mean that the black holes will forever remain a mystery because the information being sought cannot be retrieved from inside. There is no inside. for all the information that you could ever find inside is on the boundary of that black hole it's 
made it out all over it. I think this is a, this is a, this is somebody's one of the physical one of the physical scientists. This is one of their theories that the entire three dimensional structure of a black hole is made on a two dimensional surface. Same thing with death. The entire mystery of death is written on the edge of life, on the boundary between life and death. The mystery between the two self, between the two states of awareness. It's pretty interesting because these are not. You know, they sound so much like metaphysical concepts only, but they're not. They're actually a part of everybody's everyday functioning. I mean, if you think this is, you know, whatever, just try to go a few days without sleep. By the time you get to day five, you'd probably be hallucinating or hearing things or you'd see your self-awareness degrade. Now, you would know that it is degrading and there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop it. If self-consciousness was a thing, this would not happen. So think about it this way. At the bottom of a swimming pool, a clean swimming pool, you see these patterns of reflect, refractive light dancing around. Hmm? Now, the light is real. The water is real. It is the interplay between the light and the water, the shape of the water, especially the flat shape, the concave and the convex shape. And these are always changing. And so they are always playing with the light. So in some areas, they focus the light. In some other areas, they disperse the light. And this accounts for the pattern at the bottom of that swimming pool. Those places where the light, is, the light becomes very focused, they're called caustics. Self-awareness, self-consciousness is a caustic. That's really what it is. If we're going to, when we are going to create truly not, not artificial intelligence, natural intelligence like a human, we would need this idea to help it define a sense of I. It's a caustic. And that is why the brain uses 20% of all the glucose in the body. Because it is projecting an image. Is projecting a reality. The first part of the projection of that reality is the sense of I. Because it is upon that that it builds everything else. And that is why in my last podcast, The Astrology of Self-Awareness or Self-Consciousness, I talked about the organizing capability of the sun and how this organizing capability of the sun represents the number six of organized complexity. And that is why when you go to the Jewish mysticism of Kabbalah, you would see that the sun represents the sixth sephira on the tree of life. That's just a hint that was, you know, thrown a pontoon from one whatever to another. That's, if you want to explore that further, you go ahead. Because what I'm trying to say is that just like building a house, constructing a building or building a structure, self-consciousness is built too, like that. And the role of the organizing principle, which is the sun in this case, and since we have only one of it, is to orchestrate the nature of reality, especially the realizations that are able to be accepted. Because self-awareness is modified, updated, or downgraded by realizations which go to restructure the seat of conviction. Now, these things sound like psychological concepts, but I always throw a pontoon. 
when you go to Judaism, hmm, the Holy of Holies, that is the seat of conviction. Judaism talks, or at least the aspect of it that I've come to understand. It's all about self-consciousness. It's all about awareness. With, and as awareness becomes focused, as self-awareness, and then what happens to these awarenesses, how they are transformed from moment to moment in different circumstances. So a wide variation of human experiences are explored. So as to be able to narrate how these consciousnesses are modified and updated and to, uh, to an increasing extent, the, these instructions or these descriptions, they are coded. They're not written explicitly. They are coded as what? As astronomical dynamics. Because it is from astronomical dynamics that the concept of astrology emerged. I mean, that's really what it is. I don't know. It's really, that's really what it is. That's why if you look at the, uh, the tree of life, you would see that there are 10 sephiros or 10 sephiroths. And there are 22 paths connecting them. And there are also 22 alephets. And each sephira represents a type of awareness, consciousness. In fact, what you're looking at is how the process by which the generalized form of awareness, which in my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity, I call the primordial consciousness, how it becomes self-awareness. That's it. That's what the cycling through the ten sephiras are. And just because one thing is one thing doesn't mean that that is all it can be. That's the modern way of interpreting things. When you, you define something in a legal context, you try to restrict it to, in such a way that it cannot mean anything else. Well, that's not how things used to be described. You can describe something and then it has a very many wide range of interpretations and all of them are true. The only things that do that today in this kind of reality that we have, are like formulas, not even formulas, you know, formulas are restrictive. That's why they're called fundamental concepts. That's what I call them. I call them fundamental concepts. In my book, I call them prescriptive knowledge spaces that are that represent the prescriptive principle, functionally specific defined spaces. That's really what it is. So, astrologically, which, you know, astrology is simply attaching meaning and concepts to astronomical dynamics. That's all perspective, meaning, and concepts. So if I, if I say A is an apple, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm associating the letter A with an apple. The reality is that the letter A is a concept. The apple doesn't care what it is called. It doesn't, the only thing the apple is called is its function. That's its connection to anything else. Outside of that, it has no existence. It is nothing. In the, the same way, uh, you say uh, the planet Jupiter has a particular characteristic astrologically. What are you talking about? This is a meaning and a concept that I have attached to this. I am attempting to describe the function of Jupiter from a psychological or experiential awareness perspective based on observations obviously from who knows how many how long a period 
characteristic function was attached to the, to, to the dynamics of Jupiter in the sky. That's human experience. So it is assumed that the orbs in the sky and all the orbs around us, if you assume that the entire universe is around you, those orbs are moving through existence, which is the primordial consciousness. The state of that primordial consciousness is unknown. It's unknowable. What we do know is that self-awareness is distilled from that. And that is why astrology defines self-awareness by looking at the orbs and the movement of the orbs because they are the closest thing to, things to us astronomically. And as they turn around and we turn around and all things go round and round, where is this round and round taking place? I mean, we, we are all physicists today. We all know of science. So we call it space, space time. It, it wasn't always known like this. You know, space time is, comes from a modern day physics. It was known as experience, awareness. That's really what it is like. It's like a fluid, an imaginary sort of like fluid. The fact we think it's imaginary, but it's really there because it's like our consciousness, our self-awareness is constantly staring. It's constantly being stared. Like in a pot or something. And we're at the bottom of this funnel. And the funnel extends out in the shape of the universe, which is actually the shape of a woman's womb, or the shape of the or of the head of a cattle. If you look at an a, an ox with its horns, that's why the, the ox and the, with the horns and everything was associated with fertility and femininity, because what they are trying to represent is the universe the darkness, the blackness that gave birth to self-awareness. Because uh, your father has, has an orgasm. He ejaculates into your, your mother in a female, the uterus or the vagina, you lead into the uterus. That is the shape of the universe. For all intents of, if you have to stretch your imagination, you think that you were ejaculated into a, a female womb and then you came out of that nine months later that's what you think what if that's not what happened what if you're still in that womb hmm? what if you're still in that womb what if nobody ever leaves that womb but the process of fertilization of the egg and the, the 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 division of the egg or whatever that's the way we understand it but maybe that's not what's happening maybe something else on a level like that is happening but it is responsible for our experience of being born being grown growing up maturing into this thing we call life with self-awareness it's a manufactured experience that's what i'm trying to tell you It's not a thing. And that the things we see as reality here are the things that our self or our sense of self that we have constructed can accept. Not just individually, but as a group also. Now, why, why did I get into this this evening? Suffice to say, or suffice to say that I've been growing in awareness for, for a few years now. I have been changing. 
and the changes have brought with them accompanying changes in my external environment. For someone who is very observant like me, it's interesting. Because the whole point of, uh, you know, I do not call astrology a belief system. Besides, Western astrology, who knows what the astrology was like, maybe, in, you know, in, in more ancient times. But just like you have a physics today that, you know, describes reality and what you can do with it to a certain, relatively comfortable uh, level. It's the same way you have Western astrology that still captures some of the key important essences or the key important points of this uh, experiential turbulence, which is what I call the self-awareness that is generated within us as these orbs spin around us and as we spin around a giant orb and, you know, these rotations, all these rotations, revolutions of everything around us, the, total, the totality of angular momentum that is generated, this is what distills our consciousness like a vortex as we form apparently in the womb of our mothers. Because the rotations and the revolutions of all the orbs and the totality of the angular momentum is obeying a script that was written by the blackness. In physics, we'll call it a gravitational interaction between dark matter and baryonic matter, but these are just words. So we are spawned into existence carrying the signature of the dynamisms that helped us to manifest physical awareness, self-awareness. And for that, we need a body. Because the whole point of self-awareness is localization. The experience of being in one place in one time. And you would say, but what else? No, this is a thing that is not us, the primordial consciousness, such a thing does not really exist. You know, it's everything is everything at every at every time. There's no there's no, there's no disconnection. There's no feeling of separateness. So in order to be, in order for there to be the experience of separateness, something needs to be done to experience. That thing that was done to experience, in order to make it what it is, so that self-awareness can be experienced, that's what is labeled as an original sin. Now, sin is not the same thing as evil, or wickedness, or whatever you want to call it. The concept of sin. It's just that the two were merged because they... The religious bodies that have formed they wanted to take a firm grip and control of the people and fear is the tool to take control of the people that are you know who do not have the sophistication of mind let's put it that way so you have to herd them like sheep and fear is what you used to do that so this thing that was done to self-awareness, self-consciousness, was uh, a truncation of its connection, apparent connect, because a truncation cannot really occur. I talked about this in many podcasts. The separation, the, the creation of the separation of self or the separation of anything cannot really occur. But the experiential awareness of that separation can be implemented by a process. 
And what that means is that even though the connection exists, you can't see it, you can't perceive the connection. And so because of that, you are able to form a sense of self that seems and acts independent from everything else, even though in actuality, this is not possible. So in simple summary terms, you need the primordial consciousness needed to create an awareness that could delude itself continuously. And that is the reason why we need to be able to, cons to construct a sense of self. That's why it needs to be actively constructed, built up. Look at the sophistication necessary to implement it. Look at the universe necessary to bring that sophistication into reality, into realization. It's a process. We see it as a 14 billion year, 14 billion year old process. When in actuality, there is no 14 billion years at all. There's nothing. For those who think that the universe is a simulation, or because you have that a lot in physics these days, you know, ideas of the universe being a simulation. No, it's not the universe that is a simulation. It is your sense of you that is a simulation. So if you're using that as a container within which to to observe the entire world, then that's what you tend to see. There is no simulation anywhere. I mean, the fact that simulation is something is a word or a concept that was created by human beings only after. Uh, the universe has made them to a sophisticated level enough to be able to create a computer. That should give the plot, that should have given the plot away that it's not the universe that is a simulation. It's the sense of self that is a simulation. Now, from that sense of self, a universe emerges. Oh, it's sort of like a Klein bottle or a plain bottle because not only is the universe in the sense of self, the sense of self is in the universe. It's like chicken and the egg, constantly trying to figure out which came first. Some would say it's the universe that came first because without a universe, how could you build the materials that would create a being that would realize a self? And I say, oh yeah, well, describe to me the beginning of the universe and let me, let me tell you how it uh, almost exactly mimics the beginning of self, the beginning of awareness. You can trace these things, you know. Talk about an expanding universe. The universe does not expand because the universe is not a thing per se. At least a physical universe is not expanding. It is awareness that is changing. If it's expanding, it's expanding into what? No, it is human awareness that is expanding into a universe. It appears to be expanding, but I have argued in one of my podcasts that this expansion, which is perceived, measured, is a little different from the opposite, which is a shrinking or a shrinkage a limitation because remember that is what was done to self-awareness to create self-awareness that is it was a truncation basically you shall go no further or you can go no further and based on that the perception of, of self and everything in existence tends to form this these limitations of form if you say, what do you mean by limitations of form? What's the limitation of form that nature readily creates? It is a sphere. And so that is the way a sense of self is also perceived. We perceive the universe as a bubble. As if existence as a bubble. That's really what it is. But the bubble is not really a universe, but it is the sense of awareness, self-awareness. The sense of I. And that is why in astrology, the self is perceived as the sun, the central organizing principle. 
and the glyph or the symbol for the representation of that sun is a circle with a dot in the middle. That's really what it is. What, what, what is it that human beings ultimately need to know that changes the realization of everybody? It's that you are not disconnected from anything. There's no separation of anything. There is, there is meaning in everything that is derived from the central meaning of the unity of all things. That's really what it is. And within that kind of paradigm, what is astrology? Just an extension of that paradigm. It is not just, you know, you can you can even foresee a kind of future where astrology is refined and properly taken out of the realm of pseudoscience and given a proper footing. The world is going to change. Everything is going to change. Even the way we build buildings and things like that. People won't be living in square boxes anymore if they truly understood the connection of everything. We we'll build economies and societies that reflect very deep principles of organized complexity. The nature of six will be built into everything. Everything from design to implementation, everything. Synchronicity will be the key word because that is the, the uh, secret to integration and the unification of all things. This is humanity's future. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not or whether you think so or not. Who cares what you think? You're a construct. You were put together according to very preset rules. <laughs> You say, what were the rules based on? The rules determine what aspect of experiential awareness will be made available to you. And it will always be made available in such a way that you feel like you are choosing. You ain't choosing nothing. That, the very idea is the prime time show of the universal comedy screen, which the entire universe watches in absolute laughter and joy. Why? Because the very idea that you could be separate in such a way as to be, to be choosing and, and, you know, and pontificating is just, it's beyond comedic. That's the whole point. I would envision that what happens after death is just a great surprise, a great, as in, you just suddenly realize that you've just been absolutely foolish. But guess what? It's not the kind of realization that means you burn in a hell forever. No. It's a realization that makes you want to come back. That's really what it is. You want to come back because you just realize I mean, what a bloody idiot you've been. And you, you realize everything that you, you were and understood before embarking on the journey and all the decisions that you made and all the resolutions that you made and the convictions that you held. And then when you got here, poof, it's all gone. You only have you only have them in flashes. If you're lucky enough to come across one who is skilled at the interpretation of astronomical dynamics, which is, um, you know, which you would call astrology, or the one who is able to read the instructions that were written down in the Torah and to decipher them correctly, then you'd be able to understand to such a level that the original realization is glimpsed. That's really what it is. And once that happens, then you are no longer in the, in the, in the, 
You're no longer in the light of self-consciousness. You now realize that's, <laughs> that's not separate from anything else. There's only one way you can be afterwards. That's really what it is. That's how everybody changes. That's how the whole world changes. The world changes due to a realization of truth. Finito. It's not about preaching and praise worshipping and all these things. All these very romantic things and poetic things that people get up to. You know. And none of that is necessary. None of that is even needed. In fact, the moment that becomes a, a core focus, then it shows that there's already an, there's all the imbalance that comes from the perception of separateness has already reached a stage whereby you're now fighting. You're now fighting <clears throat> battles of hy or hydras. That's really what it is. Heads that multiply. So that is the nature of choice. You, you choose to fight all these battles and you, know, you wear out the body. Because the body is just uh, something that is put together. Something that is built by the primordial consciousness to answer the, the, the question. Is a question, it's, you know. The question needs to be answered because it has already been answered. Perfection is perfect. There's no time. There's no past, present, or future. So you see, how can a, a question arise in perfection if there's no past, present, and future? Well, the infinite possibility potential, which is the nature, one aspect of the, it's not the nature of the primordial consciousness, because no one knows its nature. It is a behavior of the primordial consciousness, where it is, it, where the possibility of every single manifestation occurs within it at the same instant. Of course, I have to say at the same instant of time because I'm, you know, I perceive my existence as a, as a construct of self, of space-time. Still, even though my awareness has grown, has expanded, but this is not something that can be realistically 100% achieved while as, as a physical, if you could do that, you wouldn't be able to function because there would be no self. Now, you don't need the totality of realization of not self to be able to transform the world. No. Because I, I mean, that would. How would that not equate to death today? In today's reality, in today's realization? How? Because we can't perceive other modes of being. So we are like light switches. We are either on or we are off. Hmm? Altered states of consciousness, all the variations in between. It's almost it's almost it's almost illegal to 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 to, uh, to alter consciousness these days because there's always something, you know. There are, always, there are all these restrictions on, you know. But the truth is that the, the natural functioning of a human self-awareness requires that consciousness be dialed down from time to time. You can't function at, it's like running a generator at 100% capacity all the time. It will break, it, break down. That's why we sleep. During sleep, what happens is, our entire body regenerates as much as it can. The way we age is that we begin to sleep less. And each sleep is not deep enough for regeneration. And so, 
imperfection begins to build in gradually. What we need to be doing is we need to build a world that we need to build a world from truth, from realization, true realization or what we call knowledge. But knowledge of what? It's not knowledge of uh, the universe because it's point, I would say pointless, but it's it's like putting a, a cart before the horse if we decide to study the universe before understanding what we are. Because that universe that we're studying, what are we studying it with? The questions that we're answering, what questions are they really? You do, an, you do a physics experiment, like, you know, you go to CERN and you observe experiments that are, that are being run. They are trying to answer questions that are important to fundamental particle physics. But what exactly are those questions? When the thing that is doing the questioning remains a complete mystery. Is it really looking for fundament, for rules or symmetries in fundamental particle physics or conservation laws in fundamental particle physics? Or is it busy looking for aspects of itself? That's an open-ended question for you, the listener. Now, the reason why I started talking about the blackness again this evening is because you know, the last week I've had to contemplate with aspects of myself that I had forgotten for a while. And then when the memories came back, I, I found myself thinking of of this process, you know, the process of memory, understanding, recall. And then it got me thinking astrologically again. Now, the ego has a structure. The ego is such a bad has been given such a bad I don't find ego to be a bad thing at all I mean there is egotistical which is a, a, um, like an imba an unbalanced ego that is exaggerated or something but that's not what I'm talking about anything that is exaggerated you know people normally frown away from it but ego is the containment, the first containment of self-awareness. That's why people who, um, the levels of awareness or consciousness, self-awareness, that is developed before Leo, tend to be very instinctual. So from Aries to Taurus to, to uh, Gemini, Cancer, the sign of Cancer, they tend to be very instinctual. Aries would be instinctual fire. Taurus, instinctual earth. Um, Gemini, instinctual air. And Cancer, instinctual water. I mean, as much as Taurus can be instinctual. But within Leo, you have the first development, the first containment of a completed ego, which is the evolution from Aries to Cancer. I've talked about this, this, these things in earlier podcasts. It is that evolution from Aries to Cancer that is contained within Leo as a self, the first level. Because you can divide the 12 houses of the or the 12 signs of the zodiac or the houses of the natal chart, you can divide them into three groups, three equal groups, made up 
made up of four signs each. Fire, earth, wind, water. Fire, earth, air, water. So remember I said fire is inspiration. Earth is materiality, physicality. Air is the intellect. And water are your emotions. And then in Leo, a new cycle starts. Inspirational fire again. Virgo, material earth. Libra, lib air. And Scorpio, water. So Scorpio is like Leo. But in Leo, you have the emergence of a singular uh, will or self that has that expresses its identity its soul identity through acts of creativity so it reinforces to itself i am a self and the way it does that is by creating something now in scorpio you have the same uh, sense of self but it's different now it's how that sense of self merges with another person how it fuses with another ego just like it such that both are annihilated and there is only one self the unique the, the nature of this one self is largely unknown until the merger takes place it's unknown and that's why the eighth house for scorpio leads to transformations those transformations are a mystery that's why the eighth house and scorpio things are very difficult to interpret you need information from everything else so to see how it goes because it depends on another party that is not available yet in Sagittarius, the third cycle starts, the third group starts. Sagittarius fire, Capricorn earth, uh, Aquarius air, Pisces water. So in Pisces you have uh, uh, the completion of, no, I need to correct something. Since Leo is the beginning of the next cycle, the self-containment or the, the self-development of Aries to Cancer, you find it in Leo. That's what the self represents as a creative entity, as a, an independent creative entity that has a will. Now, that thing I described in Scorpio, you actually find it in Sagittarius. The transformed being, where it arrives or what it becomes, you can only find that in Sagittarius, not in Scorpio. Scorpio is just the annihilation of both, of two individual egos to form one. But the identity of that ego, what it becomes, what that self actually transforms into, can only be found in Sagittarius or the ninth house. Now that is what I call the energy of release. Because the process of annihilation of those egos, it happens when two people fall in true love with each other. That's really what it is. It's not about two people having sex. The eighth house is not about sex. Because these days, sex means something else. You have so many reasons. Every You can have... Every house can be associated with sex for different reasons. But the type of sex that takes place in the eighth house is not that type of sex. It's true love. Or whatever you experience as true love. You would know it's true because it's able to rewrite your convictions. Your seat of convictions. Your holy of holies. And this is not a place that I mean, you can see from the, from the observance of Yom Kippur. 
in the in the in Judaism, one day is allotted for, and you know it's perceived as a day of atonement. So this is not a small thing we're talking about here. But that is the nature of the eighth house that gives it a kind of transformation that releases the energy of Sagittarius of the, of the ninth house because it is the energy of Sagittarius, the release that takes place in Sagittarius. That is what is used to build the physical reality of Capricorn as an achievement. So Capricorn is literally the the the, the self as envisaged in Sagittarius. Right? Is carried upon as a type of fire. It's an inspiration of some kind, but it is deep within the sight. It is close to not deep within, sorry. It has emerged from deep within the psyche and purified through all the signs that in Sagittarius it is just a, a kind of spark that allows you to achieve success in material reality. Which is what Capricorn is. And because Capricorn is at the top of the chart in the 10th house, and symbolized by the, the mountain goat with a sea with a sea a, you know a sea tail or the tail of a fish it's a very interesting glyph i'll do a, i'll do a, a podcast on that glyph someday but the fact is this represents the source of Capricorn's ability to achieve. It comes from deep within the emotions, the transformatory properties of Scorpio encountered in the eighth house. The mysteriousness of that transformation. That is what is now constructed and put together over time. And that is why true love doesn't mean that everything begins to work. True love is what sustains that building project that is manifested in Capricorn as the great project, the great work. Every, Cap every prominent Capricornian understands the concept of the great work, the great task, which is not, it could be nothing, but all your life you have felt like there's something that you needed to do. Something that will take time, something that, you know, your life's work, sort of. Every Capricornian experience contains this kind of understanding. It colors their output. And when they haven't found it, it's, you know, one thing no, most Capricorns won't tell you is the amount of inferiority complex they struggle with. Because it's almost like you are being judged from a higher perspective. Much it so much has been expected of you. That's how you know. That's the feeling. Now. Although there are a lot of details in all of these things because you, know, you have modifications all over the chart. I mean, charts are like palettes of, you know, they're like artworks and, you know, the primordial consciousness, God, is the one who writes the script and, you know, and out emerges a unique self-awareness that is limited by, by design, but able to focus in such a way that it can experience the pleasure of the pleasure of limitation and self-containment. The pleasure to experience an illusion like choice. We've talked about this, we have talked about this before. Now, the success that Capricorn builds 
once that suspect, su uh, success has been accepted by society, acclaimed by society, recognized by society, then the, in the individual is invited to join those who have also been successful. And that is what shows up in Aquarius. Those who have been similarly successful in similar fields, but those who recognize the contribution of the Capricornian to the field, and that is the uniqueness that is enjoyed by Aquarius. It is a unique because what is achieved in Capricorn from the recognition of success is stature, reputation. You know, that is that feeling that. Uh, self has that it has become somebody and in Aquarius it becomes a member of those who have already been somebody and They are also invited to create their own unique um, organizational being, for instance, a unique field of knowledge or unique uh, area of expertise or whatever, whatever they were recognized for. They're now given the ability to create their own niche. Now in Pisces, you begin to see what this thing they have created, this organization they have created, or this way of being that they have introduced into the world that is now accepted, you now see how that becomes a legacy. So in cancer, because this is another correction to what I said earlier, in cancer, the emotion con is able to contain the fire of Aries, the earth of Taurus, the air of Gemini, all mixed together in the sign of cancer of water. Okay, so it is that package that beco that becomes represented as a self in Leo. So within Leo, you can find these Aries, you know, this energy of Aries, this energy of Taurus, this energy of Gemini, this energy of Cancer, in balance in Leo. So the challenge of the Leonine entity is to be able to feel this awareness as self-significance. That's it. Now, there are times when, because Leo's ability to, to feel his or her own self-significance is a natural evolutionary process for Leo. At some point, Leo's will feel this way. And that changes the, the display of the Leonine character. Because you have two levels of display. Now, if further statements are made to the Leonine position or to the Sun or to whatever, in such a way as to modify the characteristics of this Leo, which is very common, you have Leo is a grouping, but you have individual Leos that are very different. What you find is the nature of this connection to self significance changes. Sometimes it is delayed in time, sometimes it is spread out in space. So the task of the individual now begins, now becomes to assemble this. It's a much harder difficulty, but it's a much harder task. But what happens is the compensation is that the, the self that is found when it ultimately touches its own self significance is far deeper than anything. So what you're looking at is a Leo that is going to be truly big. Once they can achieve that, So, in Scorpio, 
the two egos meet, annihilate, and transform into a singular entity that is unknown. Now, in Pisces, what happens is the ego, the self-awareness, dissolves into nothing because it merges with everything. It comes into the truth of its own realization. That is the nature of Pisces. It realizes that there is no separateness of self. There never has been. There's no past, there's no present, there's no future. There's what is, and that's it. You know, even our language of what is is still descriptive of our present. But the whole part, the whole point is that in Pisces there is no separateness of any kind. The experience, the individuation of the ego is not so easy to achieve anymore in Pisces. When the individual tries, they feel spread out. And so since they cannot focus that awareness as a self-consciousness, they tend to be in many things at the same time. So it's difficult to concentrate on in this physical realization. So the tendency is there to drift and dream. But this is just the energy of the experiential awareness that is letting go of its illusions. So anywhere you find Pisces in your natal chart, that is the place where you are most likely to spiritualize, which is to connect with everything else in terms of your awareness, to experience the truth of realization truth of reality that is and Neptunian energy is often known for illusions and that's because when Neptune or Pisces is impinging on her in an area that is not very comfortable with that kind of experiential awareness then the house for instance if it is Pisces on an earth, on an earth house the house tries to, for instance, the earth house tries to, it operates according to the modalities of earth. It doesn't matter what sign is sitting on the cusp. To understand how it is supposed to operate, it looks at the sign, looking for instruction on how to operate. And it wants to be told to be able to do earth things, material things, physical things. But when it looks on the si at the sign on the cusp, it's a water sign. And it's the Pisces, the deepest of all water signs. It has no idea how to extract practicality from that. So it begins the process of practicalizing Pisces, which then manifests as religious tendencies, mysticism, spirituality, and all that. It also manifests as a uh, Filmmaking, imagining all those areas that require imagination, dreaming, daydreaming, that is. I see. So that is that energy. But it also means that sometimes uh, misunderstandings occur in the sense that Pisces cannot supply the experiential awareness needed by the Earth House. So when that aspect of the echo of experience is triggered. The calculus that is done, because it is done, being done with deep, very deep emotions, the person cannot really see how every process in that area goes. So they paper over the, the details with a lot of fanciful, imaginary assumptions. They cannot penetrate into it. And we all know that reality is uh, nitty gritty in terms of, you know, things have a way that they work. So often these uh, assumptions from Pisces and on Earth House are tested. And that's when uh, uh, the, na the native with such placements can experience disillusionment. It could also be disillusionment with relationships. For instance, Pisces on an air, an air house like Libra. 
that could also bring disillusionment because you're not seeing I mean, what is taking place in the 7,000 Libra. It's social dynamics, it's communication, it's mental. It's an intellectual house, meaning the transactions that take place there are intellectual. When a sign like Pisces comes to sit on it, the air house cannot see the entire processes of its social negotiation or social interaction. It assumes certain things about the interaction it is having with people that it wants to go into a relationship with. It cannot see the details of the people that, you know, for instance, a typical conversation is not processed from a socially or from a social intelligence point of view. It's processed with, instead with, uh, a type of spiritual awareness. It's, you know, I wouldn't call it intuition because that is uh, that is the realm of uh, Scorpio. So it is something beyond intuition, something much finer than intuition that has no details at all. So the, when you have Pisces on the cusp of the seventh, you don't see people the way that they are. And consequently, they do not see you the way that you are. Because where you think you understand someone, you clearly don't. Because you can't see them correctly. And where they think they understand you, they don't. Because they cannot see you correctly. And so Pisces on the cusp of descendant, which would typically be a Virgo rising, or thereabouts, depending on the position of the ruler of Pisces, um, you know, would require uh, uh, adjustment to its uh, experiences in that house. Even if Pisces were sitting on the cusp of the third house, it would still require, because the third house is also an intellectual house. You know, intellect, you got to see how it goes. One thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. In Pisces, you just jump from A to Z. You assume that there are letters in between. Disillusionment occurs when something has been written that doesn't contain all the letters from A to Z. And so the individual finds out that reality is not like it, they thought it was. Uh, if Pisces occupies a firehouse, I think the same dynamic would take place. But since fire represents inspiration, and inspiration represents uh, the closest uh, thing to the uh, to what is drawn from the primordial consciousness in terms of ideas ideation the ability to conceive an idea and not just to conceive an idea through some type of imagination but to be moved propelled into action by the force of that idea the intensity of that idea that's what you have in Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius, is the ability to ideate with force. I mean, think about it. What we call energy in the physical universe usually has fire behind it. So fire is energy, pure heat. And it propels motion, it forces you to act. Now, in, in Aries, the action is cardinal, it's impulsive because the fire is so hot. It just wants to burn. In Leo, the fire is more measured, it is contained, so it can be directed, and that's why Leo is a fixed sign. And the fixed signs are noted for power. Um, in Sagittarius, it becomes mutable, so this is the fire you can take from one place to another. You can transfer it, you can, it's not only, it's more measured, but it is, instead of being one powerful controlled fire in Leo, instead of being a very hot, directionless, scalar quantity in Aries, it is a laser of sorts in Sagittarius. So that is the possibility of many lasers. So the fire breaks down into many type of fires. 
which all sort to some together to reveal the fire and Leo. But in Sagittarius, they have the ability to shoot in any direction. Okay. Now, when Pisces comes on the cusp of these this type of house or these type of houses, uh, fire. The experiential awareness is like trying to draw fire from water. That's really what it is. That's not very successful. So the tendency is to be able to, because if you burn, if the fire becomes hot enough, really, really, really hot, like in Aries, what you have is steam. But you see, the, I once, you know, I, I once gave a podcast about this when I talked about the twelve houses of astrology. The houses are receptive areas of experience. They contain the things that you expect. The signs are the active part of the natal chart. They provide the energy or the context or the impetus for the meanings that are derived in the house. But all the action takes place in the houses and the houses don't move. So the houses are feminine, the signs are masculine, this yin and yang, that's my own interpretation of it. But, or is it? I don't remember. So that's that's really what it is, you know, in terms of um, trying to draw inspiration, powerful inspiration, activating inspiration from from the emotions. Usually, it requires a connection, an emotional connection to somebody. And if it's Pisces, then it requires an emotional connection to this to the primordial consciousness. The sense of oneness that is the universe <clears throat> that is the universal consciousness that is where the spark can be drawn from, otherwise Pisces won't give you any fire so that is it that's basically you know what it is that brings me to the conclusion of this podcast and you know. I do apologize for the low volume, the low audio. It's quite late here. I have to keep the volume down. But the the general idea I started off with was it's not about the light and the darkness. They are not in opposition. There's no competition in terms of we are of the light and of the darkness and more of the darkness when i say the darkness i don't mean an evil thing or a bad thing you know these are recent associations in the human mind blackness is not a bad thing okay blackness or darkness is the it's the, it's the more natural state for for existence because take a look all the lights in the skies are surrounded by blackness i mean what what else even the bright sun the brightest you can't even stare at the sun it is surrounded by blackness it's, it's the mother it's the you know it's the background that constructs everything it stays in the background it doesn't you don't see it you don't even feel it but it is where the instruction for everything is written. And it only looks black and dark because we are limited in our perception. So as to be able to create self-awareness. And this I describe as the original sin. It's not a sin. A sin does not mean that it is evil or it is bad. A sin as described as that original sin simply means that 
it is a process, a deliberate process of limitation. So as to be able to create a further good. Because it is that process that is responsible for the emergence of self-awareness. And even though today we have succeeded in making, you know, we've succeeded in making meaning very difficult to extract from the universe. In fact, all the meaning we make these days revolves around what we can stuff in our pockets and money. But the meaning that we should actually be making is far more, in fact, it's such a lofty purpose and so high, it is worthy of a manifest, the manifestation of a universe. You know? I remember a comment I made, I said, the sex that takes place in the eighth house has is very different from the one that takes place in the fifth house. For instance, the fifth house is a house of creative expression. Creativity is all about expressing the joy contained within self or the joy that comes from being a significant self. Okay? Recognized by yourself. And it's play, it's playful sex, but you know, people you play with. The sex that takes place in the eighth house is as a result of true love. And I've heard a lot of things, but true love, you know, most, well, I need to do a podcast on love. It's really what it is. I think it's long overdue, to, to be honest. I need to do a podcast on love. You talk about love what it is because true love is very it's something that is you know we read a lot of we, as kids we watched a lot of uh, narratives and stories and you know, Disney cartoons and all that about true love true love's kiss and all these things they go into cliche they become stereotypes but the real meaning of what is talked about is not apparent it's not about the kiss, it's not about the, no. It's what happens to the individual self, the seat of conviction, when a human experience touches true love. How do you know what, you say, how do you know what true love is? You will know, when you touch true love, it will annihilate your ego, not because it attacks you and kills you, because Anything that attacks you will immediately raise your defenses up. No. You surrender your ego in true love. You merge with another. That's really what it is. So the kind of, if when there's a sexual union in the eighth house, it's transformational. And if it is true love, there's only one diary, there's only one thing it does to you, it lifts you up. It reboots your ego, the nature of self, and infuses it with a quality that can only be described as the optimism of Sagittarius. Somebody believes in you to the point of merging with you. Not talking about the, you know, this, we're talking true, genuine, true love. It's an, it's a, it's a, it's an invitation. And there's one thing about it that I've noticed. It is exclusive. I don't care what anybody says. It is absolutely exclusive. It's not you and five other people or you and ten other people or you and two other people. 
it's two coming together to become one. A typical example would look like it's is what we see all the time as a as an eclipse of the sun or as a full eclipse of the sun or the moon. We are two objects that are so different in size and proximity as to be qualitatively very different. Yet they come together in perfect harmony on occasion. That is magic and it's a very powerful energy. And that's what happens in, in true love. That's why it is called a transformation. And that's why Sagittarius follows it. If it was meant to, if it were not true love, it, you know, it, it doesn't have that quality of Sagittarius that goes on into Capricorn. So all, for all of you out there, the deepest wish or the greatest wish I can wish for every one of you is to, at some point in time in your life, to experience the power of true love. I mean, it's not love that you can really force or you can make somebody love you or you can manipulate them into loving you or you can know it's it's harmony it's part of the invitation the bliss that goes on there it's the harmony of the seven the negotiation that takes place in the seven the harmony it creates deep feel no it's not about just the Eight house being true love is the connection in the seven, the negotiation in the seven being true, and how it all falls together in the eighth to blend into this form of awareness that releases you into success or into optimism. Now, the opposite is also true. There's some people who will suck the optimism out of you. They suck the success out of you. And the, 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 you, 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 you merge with them, and instead of becoming one, you become fragmented into a thousand, thousand pieces. Those are the people you actively avoid. They are, because the, what they bring into that place is not commensurate with what. And usually this happens when the negotiation in Libra is false. Because what we're describing from Aries to Pisces is the procession of the the evolution of self awareness in truth. So if you're if you meet a pretender who is able to camouflage in such a way where you now convince that this is true, and you go into the eighth house that's like approaching <laughs> I, I wouldn't say this but it is not a very wise thing to do the results can be devastating okay this is where i'll leave this for now thank you for listening